I'm Alec Baldwin, and you're listening to Marketing Trends and the Leeds Art Week. When it comes to marketing in 2020, Marty Kine, the Senior Vice President of Strategy for Salesforce Marketing Cloud, said it best. This was both a cultural shift, a consumer behavior shift, and then also an economic shift. So advertisers had to react to all those things, changes in consumer behavior, changes in the channels that people were consuming ads on, and then also just the kind of economic pain behind the scenes, which affects advertising anyway. I mean, advertising is very much driven, tied to GDP in general. So I think that you saw just tons of stuff. PhD theses will be written for years to come on 2020 and how advertisers reacted. While 2020 threw society a major curveball, and we're all still working our way through certain things, the business world has carried on and it adapted at a pace unseen before. We welcomed Marty back to Marketing Trends to dissect some of what happened in 2020, including the ways marketers were forced to pivot. Plus, Marty also explains why digital channels have altered the marketing landscape for good and how influencers rose in importance. Enjoy this episode. Marketing Trends Podcast is brought to you by Salesforce. We bring marketing and engagement together. Learn more at salesforce.com slash marketing. Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm Ian Faison, host of Marketing Trends. And today we have recurring guest, Marty, how are you? I'm good. Hi, Ian. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a while since we had you on the show. And boy, are we excited to talk about something a little different. Last time we went super deep on uh, on CDPs about customer data platforms and, and everything that's uh, that's going on with your data. And today we're going to talk more about kind of trends of what, what has happened in 2020. Um, it's been, uh, you know, the craziest year in memory for sure. And, uh, and so we're going to go through some of like how advertising shaped that, some of the phases, and just kind of chat about those things uh, to kind of close out, close out the year. So, you know, let's get into it. I guess initial thoughts, Marty, um, you know, wh- where are we at? <laughs> Well, you know, as I say, as I'm sure we all say, when we got, you know, woke up on New Year's Day 2020, this was not the year we envisioned. If we can even remember New Year's Day or the day after, uh, this was not the 2020 we thought would happen. It's been very strange. I think, uh, you know, we're gradually emerging from a sense of panic and so on. So I think that, you know, the, the positive trends are good. Uh, from an advertising perspective, it's been very interesting to see because uh, there have been recessions before, obviously, some, some major one. 2008, there was the banking crash, and then 2001, dot-com bomb and um, collapse, and then recessions before then. But this was, uh, this was both, you know, sort of a um, cultural shift, you know, a consumer behavior shift, and then also an economic shift. So advertisers had to react to all those things, changes in consumer behavior, changes in you know, the channels that people were consuming ads on, and then also just the kind of economic pain behind the scenes, which affects advertising anyway. I mean, advertising is very much driven, tied to GDP in general. So I think that you saw just tons of stuff. And then also social unrest. I mean, uh, advertisers had to react to what was going on in in the the greater, you know, world. So it's been fascinating to watch. And I think it's a phase, you know, different phases they went through. We can talk about those, but it's uh, it's been a real, I think... (laughs) PhD theses will be written for years to come on 2020 and how advertisers reacted. Yeah, totally. And so we're going to we're going to get super deep on the advertising piece of this, um, which I think, you know, we actually don't talk a ton of advertising on this show normally, um, but uh, but every now and then we do. And I think one of the things that's interesting to me is you talked about how advertising, you know, mirrors mirrors GDP. Yeah. But what's funny is for a lot of companies that actually didn't really happen. Uh, specifically, like tech never really slowed down. Yeah, I don't know if you have any data, you know, behind uh, behind the the speed or the slow here, but like a lot of tech companies, it was the total opposite from the perspective that every single CIO woke up, you know, March whatever thirtieth, and all of a sudden they had to completely, you know, redesign their digital transformation on the fly. Their five-year timeline became a, a two-week timeline, and you had a lot of tech companies that needed to figure that out. Now, you know other types of of marketing and messaging, how you use agencies versus not using agencies. 
the whole concept of like having a content calendar, planning these long term campaigns, you know, how that fits into all of these airport buys, all of the, you know, out of home stuff. Nobody's going out of home. I mean, you know, the, the, the waste numbers were astronomical going and re, you know, going to those folks and saying like, Hey, I, you know, I know I just bought a subway takeover, but like, ain't nobody using the subway. I, we got to figure some way to, to refigure this out. I mean, you know, flexibility was the most important thing in 2020 for marketers and resilience, you know, people obviously being happy if, if you still have a job and things like that and, and working through a lot of the chaos. But I think that, you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, we talked to last episode about the idea of like plumbing and having your, you know, your foundation set as a marketer with data and things like that. But if you had a really clear structure to your organization, those folks could, you know, turn on a dime uh, a lot easier. And for folks who didn't, it was a lot more challenging. Yeah, it was, I mean, the, the decisions were being made, you know, week by week, day by day. I think we saw Mid-March, I think it got real for people. I can remember I was in Manhattan in the Salesforce Tower there at Bryant Park. And I think when the NBA season was was uh, canceled, that's the right season, right? I'm not big on sports. Yeah. But it was kind of like, uh, we're not going to do it. And uh, then it seemed very real all of a sudden. And then, um, you know, the, the governor, Governor Cuomo started saying, well, you know, we're, we're suggesting that you shelter at home for a couple of weeks just so the, so the hospitals aren't overwhelmed. So we're like, oh, God, two weeks at home. Oh, man. You know, that was the beginning of this marathon. But I think that companies reacted the same way. They're like, OK. And then there was, there was a sense of panic, like in late, late March. So nobody knew what the future would bring. Nobody knew how bad this would get, et cetera. And for instance, you know, travel and hospitality spend went to zero basically overnight. And um, like you said, there were some categories that, that uh, kept spending and spent more over time. Insurance kept, kept up the spend and subscription video kept up the spend and um, tech companies, as you said, software. But there, was, there, was a lot of, and there were a lot of ads running in March that were just totally inappropriate all of a sudden. There was um, a famous, like the, there's a Geico one where everyone's going around high-fiving everyone <laughs> and that was still running and they had to take that down. And then KFC had one, obviously people remember this, where the people were doing finger licking good and all that. You can't really do that in a, in a time of uh, social distancing. So, you know, then there was a shift, a pivot. So it's like, all right, we got to remove tone deaf ads. And that took a little bit, a couple of weeks. Then there was a shift, I think, maybe too far the other way where they had very generic ads that appeared that were like, okay, we're going to be empathetic. And those are the ones you're mentioning, the parody that came out, but it was basically, um, we know that, you know, everything's falling apart and everyone's dying, but, you know, we're here for you and we're all in this together and there'd be some piano playing. And I don't mean to belittle it. This, the spirit I think was good, but the execution was sometimes a little bit equally tone deaf on the, on the other side. And then, you know, I think that what happened, that was through March, this sense of panic. And then I think um, right around May or so, people started to get their act together and there was a reemergence. And then, then there was a lot more testing at that point where companies started to figure out, well, what's actually going to work? Uh, I don't need to do this sort of brand washing anymore. I can do promotional ads. And um, there's more creativity that we're seeing. I mean, there was, I'll give you just one example here for that, that May area. Uh, and spend was still down. I mean, spend was down across the board, 20%. E-commerce was up, by the way. But um, P&G came out in, in some point in May, I think. And, and they said they were, they were seeing you know, more sales, P&G slightly more, mostly driven by consumables, so essential goods. And they were spending more on advertising, but they did a, quite a lot more on, on uh, social. So it was TikTok. And they had, this, they had the social distancing dance challenge. They had 10 billion views. And I think about that and I'm like, there's only, you know, 7 billion people on the planet. So how is it possible to have 10 billion views? But people watch it more than once, I guess. But you see, that's an extreme example. But Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that is pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, you know, it was like, uh, we all saw this, but it was um, engagement with social was way up, um, but ad spend was down. So the consumer behavior shifted very rapidly overnight to mobile and social. And then uh, advertisers had to kind of scramble to figure out where they were. And sometimes you could, they could be, I heard of um, real opportunities like Facebook's uh, CPMs were cost per ads were down 50% in some cases. So smart advertisers were swooping in and buying cheap inventory 
and running, you know, a lot more advertising at a, on a, a, at a discount, really. Yeah, it's funny, you know, talking to a lot of, uh, you know, on the B two B side, talking to a lot of marketers that that pulled a lot of uh, yeah. uh, a lot of their digital spends um, and their run a site type stuff because they're like, you know, like we need to focus on stuff that drives impact. Yeah, and we don't need to focus on you know driving clicks right now. And it's a, it's an interesting thing that you know everybody always thinks that you know Facebook is is. Um, essentially like un- untouchable as a, mm-hmm. as an advertiser, you know, when it comes to just people are always going to, you know, be there and be using it. And it's funny to see certain types of products just like that. That's one of the first cuts. I was pretty shocked by that. And again, I, this is just anecdotal from, and, and on B2B, which, you know, inherently doesn't use as much of that type of adver- advertising inventory, but I just think that, you know, people always talk about Google and Facebook as kind of this, like, you know, the, the two, the two monsters in the room that eat up 80% of the ad dollars and all that stuff. And it's like at Google, I, you know, I, I, I don't know any stats behind it, but seemingly went, went absolutely nowhere and people still kept, you know, needing demand, you know, search, but, uh, yeah. but Facebook is like, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, that's like a pretty fascinating thing, especially when, you know, I'm sure that for a lot of the e-commerce stuff where, like you said, if a lot of the brand advertisers are jumping out of Facebook, then a lot of the people who, you know, grew up using Facebook ads to, to drive those like high conversion uh, e-commerce sales could jump in, back in to, to, to spend a little bit more. Yeah. And, and certain categories do okay. I mean, in, in recessions in general, there's things called like a, th- thought of as affordable luxuries. So they're sort of like, they're not expensive, but they're slightly indulgent. Those, those tend to actually hold up well. Things like skincare. So people spend more on skincare. And because of this shelter at home thing, this kind of social distance thing that we were all going through, there were some obvious categories that, that did really well. Baby spend, anything related to baby was up, you know, two double in terms of ad spend. And it was, a lot of it was uh, in digital video. It was directly related to YouTube and, and Hulu. But that would be, you know, anything, anything home and, and hearth and ha- house related. It was, it's kind of uh, interesting. You can, you can see the phase, the psychological phases people went through. Oh yeah. The, like the restoration hardwares of the world, those sort of things. It's like, yeah, it was very, people got very cozy all of a sudden and they were all like, you know, padding their nests and, and, and I was like, oh, this is so sickening and predict, but then I was doing it myself. I'm like, oh, that looked like a nice, you know, comforter. I could really use that on my bed. <laughs> So I think we were all going through the same. And skincare, you know, of course, all of our skin was very parched all the time. So like, I live, a nice moisturizer could really uh, help here. And then, yeah, and, then, and then the social phenomenon as well. I mean, people were just whiling away all the time they used to be commuting and maybe listening to radio ads just on social networks, basically wasting time. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's funny from the podcast perspective, we saw podcasts, you know, like, you know, drop significantly in a, in a lot of areas. But what's funny is like, yeah, there's no sports, right? Yeah. So of course that's going to fly down. Um, I'm sure, you know, I'd be curious. I, I would imagine that, you know, with the election season, um, you know, starting essentially at the beginning of the year, uh, I'd imagine that some of those political podcasts were potentially up. I know from our perspective, like we didn't really see much of a change at all in our business podcasts. Like yeah. people, if anything, they need more advice and information and they want to hear what other people are doing. So, you know, we didn't see... Uh, a huge change there, you know. Anecdotally, you hear people changing their, you know, their habits, but, but I think some of that stuff was short lived. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious, it, what, what you see from like those type of those type of things is, is does that stuff just go back to normal? You know, people have, um, we have habits. I mean, most of us sort of fall into a pattern, and the big, the big change was the uh, lack of a commute. I think a commute for those of us in cities took up a lot of time and that was time that we spent consuming media for the most part and a lot you know a lot of that was podcasting but as we you know as you could say obviously that time didn't disappear it, it still exists there's still 24 hours of the day so i think it took a little bit that's why i say from march to may for people not only brands but for people to settle into their new routine and that new routine did did uh, eventually i think involve um going back to podcasts and the sense of panic, the, the kind of march to May, which is just staring into the headlights, wondering where the train was going to mow us down, that passed. You know, we, we got over that. And I think we were settling into new routines. And um, 
you know, when, when we go back to, if we, if indeed we go back to commuting and back to a life that resembles what it was, you know, in, in January and February, then I think a lot of our old routines will come back and you know, the channels that we use will, will come back. The one difference is the one you alluded to, which is digital transformation. I think that's real. And we see that at Salesforce. I mean, our Q, Q1 wasn't so hot. Q2 was really good. And I think it's because um, a lot of companies are realizing they have to digitize fast. Whether or not things return to totally what they were like before, it's definitely a much more digital world than it was. And you know that's true for advertising as well. OTT, over the top, connected TV, inventory was up, interest was up, digital video, you know, ad buying in general was up. So these digital channels are, uh, they were already winning, but now they're like really winning. Well, I think that, you know, I think that there are some things that behaviorally forced people out of their comfort zones that will change forever. I think people being more comfortable with e-commerce, mm, yeah, you know, I, I think that that's one of the things that like, you know, my, my, my mom and dad, uh, who, you know, could not leave the house essentially for, you know, yeah a long time, nine months, whatever, you know, they got started getting their groceries delivered. Like they're never going back to the store, like ever. They're going to have their groceries delivered forever now. And like, I just think that there's a lot of different things like that, that, that you kind of saw those, those shift in habits that say like, yeah, I guess I can buy my, I can buy clothes online and try them on and throw them back in the bag if I don't like them and send them back. Or, you know, I know that some of those things kind of seem like they're so obvious, but you know, they're kind of not. And the other thing with like the digital tools piece is like, you have a lot of these like brick and mortar or, or very analog things like, you know, the California DMV or like, you know, things like that, that all of a sudden your only connection to people is through an application for a lot of people or, you know, whatever, or any type of organization. And I think that that part of the digital transformation was like, they had to reimagine for the first time ever, what if we have to only be digital? Like, what would that look like? And for a lot of organizations that have spent their whole lives just kind of like, you know, leaning on the fact that, well, people are going to come through the door. When you have to say like, what if they don't for six months, you have to build a digital experience. And then once you start building a digital experience, people start using it. And then you're like, oh, this actually turns out it's a little easier, easier to track. It's easier to fulfill. And this is probably just better for us to be able to do this. So, um, you know, again, those are sweeping generalizations, but like, I think that those type of, that type of like, you don't have a crutch anymore to just say like, this is, you know, how things used to be. And it got people out of their comfort zones, which can totally change behavior. You mentioned the, the government, the DMV and, um, I think that what it did starkly this this year is it it put those those either those companies or those categories that were not digitizing fast enough into stark you know relief. It became very obvious a lot of the government agencies just aren't where they need to be, and even the unemployment insurance you know there was tremendous demand and they were um, they were relying on COBOL and uh, I don't know people remember it from the seventies. It's a language nobody even knows anymore, programming language. So there was a just a real imperative to get your digital act together. And I, I think that the, you know, the governments will, the, they're an extreme example, but certain categories, even like healthcare, healthcare providers are, um, and so on are not, not as good where they need to be. And even certain retailers where they need to be. And so this, that's what we mean by digital transformation being accelerated. It's like the ones who are good are more obviously good. And the ones who are not good are more obviously not good. And just one thing I'd mentioned that when you were talking, I thought of the, the trend to no code and low code, which is something that Scott Brinker talks about a lot. The idea there is that you don't need to be a programmer to develop an application. And so I think that that trend is people talk about a lot more than they used to this year. And that has gotten pretty real. I don't think it's, it's not truly practical yet, but we are getting to a place where, you know, for instance, an employee at the DMV will be able to develop an app without coding. So they'll be able to kind of point and click. And once we get there, I think that we'll see even, you know, more improvement in some of these laggard industries. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think where it changes the equation for marketers and for advertisers is that there's new people searching for those, for solutions to those problems that were never searching for that. Because they just were like, this is my lot in life, right? Like, 
there's no way to to change how many people are standing physically in line in front of you know my office or to change you know wait times on a on a call or something like that and those are little tweaks that it's like you can now use those advantages and now market them right if you're the type of uh you know insurance company that your average wait time is 3 minutes and your competitors is 17 minutes like that's ammo for your arsenal to be able to say like hey we have a you know we have a 100% digital experience you know, average wait times three minutes, our competitors are, are 17, you know, good luck with them. And things like that, that I think, you know, speak to the pain points of the audience in a way that's much more targeted than like a lot of the tone deaf stuff that we saw, which is just like, hey, we're here for you. It's like, well, are you here for me? Because I don't really know what that means, but I do know what a 17 minute wait on the phone is. And you're totally right about e-commerce. I mean, we saw the commerce cloud business was way up and um, shift e-commerce. And that, that meant that the storefronts had to get better. And not only did they have to get better, but they had to start doing things like being able to you know, deliver curbside delivery and things that were you know, necessitated by social distancing that may not have been capabilities before, but they had to they had to kind of enable those within weeks. And the reason was, you know, their competitor was doing it. They're going to miss out on two weeks of sales. That's significant. So the speed with which these um, features had to be kind of developed and implemented really, really accelerated this year. I think that that whole idea of doing it fast was, it was a matter of life and death. I mean, these retailers have slim margins at best. And if they miss a couple of weeks, um, it, it can be, you know, quite catastrophic. The other thing is there are, there are some categories that we saw and that I saw as a consumer that became digital that weren't before, really. And uh, two good examples are cars, automobiles, and real estate. I think before this year, most people would not have bought a house without actually going there. <laughs> yep. And yet people do that now. It's unthinkable. And then the other thing is who would ever order a car online and just have it delivered? That's uh, maybe a Tesla, but that's it. Um, but now that's quite routine. So I think it's interesting to see just about anything could be part of e-commerce. <laughs> and gosh, if that isn't the biggest um, indictment of the car industry and, and why <laughs> Tesla's stock rises every day, because they, they realize that if you create the, uh, you know, the perfect vehicle that you can just drop it at somebody's doorstep, that's, it's pretty crazy. Well, I, well, I admit though, I mean, I, I, we have a Tesla story, but I went on there to configure my Tesla, as we all do, and the site, and they had a button, buy. And I'm like, it can't be that simple. Like, I just hit this button and I bought a Tesla. <laughs> and then my wife is like, make sure you don't hit it twice. <laughs> yeah, right. You get two Teslas. Well, so, so I bought a car online, not actually online, but I, I, I went into the dealership yeah. um, during COVID. And uh, it was the best car buying experience ever because the prices were transparent on the site. And it's because they had to be transparent because if you wanted to buy it right away. Now, I, I needed to test drive the car because I'd never um, driven this particular car. I was pretty sure this is what I wanted. And like the sales rep didn't even know how to behave. I mean, it was like really weird because he was just like, I was just like, yep, like, you know, get the keys, let's test drive it. And like we're driving and he's kind of trying to talk, you know, about X, Y, or Z and we get back and I'm like, okay, yep, good to go. And it, it ended up taking, I think, like two hours at the dealership total. He's like, man, this is going to be the fastest sale ever. You're going to be out of here in two hours. And the whole time I was thinking, how is this so slow? Mike, this is unbelievably slow. You were way down the funnel. Yeah, you were way down there. But that's the crazy thing, right? Is like... <laughs> yeah, no, our expectations. Yeah, I was just like, this is impossibly slow. And I had to wait for the guy. And they were uh, they were doing things in triplicate with like literally not an online experience, not signing things online. And I was just like, this is lunacy. And it's funny because in the future, like there is no way that that is the experience, right? No. If you want a car, you're going to be able to, they'll toss you the keys, you'll sign the dotted line and you'll drive it home. Or like you said, you know, a lot of the people that are just buying it and, and it shows up directly at home. And, you know, you see things like Carvana that are advertising a ton uh, OTT about, you know, the way car buying should be and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, nobody ever thought to put a car in a vending machine until us. I mean, they, they spent a ton of money on advertising in, during COVID. 
the actually, in fact, the car categories, because I used to, at the agency I was at, we had a car client. And so I became interested in car advertising. They spend a lot of money on advertising, one of the biggest categories and they, as an industry. And they went through the phases as well. The car, I mean, the spending of the industry in March dropped drastically. It went down to like, you know, 80%. And then in, in May started to come back a little bit. I think um, people, there was pent up demand. So people stopped buying cars, essentially. You know, there were a few months in there, March to, to May, when people just, you know, weren't buying cars, weren't buying houses. So I think a lot of the acceleration that we saw later in the summer was just pent up demand. People who had planned to buy a car, put it off. They're like, all right, I'll buy it now because I feel a little more comfortable. And same with the house. And so in the fall, the TV you know, spend bounced back for the car business, but it was the, the nature of the ads was a lot less of the cars driving down the windy road you know, in the, in the rainstorm or whatever. <laughs> it was a lot more about promotions, multi-model promotions, and um, you know, very tactical things like um, offers, you know, that kind of thing. So it's what we might call direct, you know, lower funnel advertising. Yeah, well, so, and, and, and with that, you know, much to the happiness of advertisers everywhere, we got the big show back in town, right? Like sports came back, yeah. specifically the NFL came back, which, you know, I don't, I, you, you might know this of, I think, you know, the NFL at the end of the year has like 19 of the 20 top, you know, rated television shows or something like that. I think it's, you know, pretty close every, every single year. Oh yeah. No, it's, it's key for advertisers. And then, you know, NBA, NBA playoffs and all that sort of stuff came back. So it all kind of came back at once, you know, sports is great. So then you have this question, right? It's like, it well, first you have the question of if the NFL doesn't come back, literally what do the advertisers do who rely on the NFL for massive amounts of advertising each year? Yeah. And then, you know, obviously in the Super Bowl being part of that, like if the NFL didn't come back, I mean, like, what do you, what would they have done? <laughs> we lost a lot of tempo. It's supposed, this was supposed to be the year of the Olympics. Uh, if anyone remembers, there was, there was, uh, you know, a lot of ad stuff was lost and a lot of ad inventory was lost, all the sports. It is it is luckily, I mean, we've been cushioned a little bit. It is a, an election year, it was 2020, big election year. And a lot of money was put into political ads, not just on social channels, but on television uh, in particular in, in some of the swing states. So that politi the political ad spend cushioned the blow, I think, even in the, in the face of what was a, definitely a recession and a downturn. But not for the advertisers. <laughs> well, yeah, where to go? I mean, particularly because sports has a lot of male viewers, so they do you know a lot of beer advertising would be on the on sports, and men are hard to reach uh, in media in general, and so a lot of it went to social. You know, social is very targetable, and so even um, consumer brands like Kraft and o and Oscar Mayer, they move all their in store promotions. So there's a lot of money um, bucketed every year to, to tactical kind of store displays. And that, you know, if stores are closed, they can't spend that. So they move that, a lot of it to social, to Twitter in particular. Oscar Mayer did like a, a barbecue promotion on Twitter. And, and so I think that, you know, the big benefit was with the social networks, although, as I said, this, the prices were down. So they, they didn't have a huge revenue uplift. But in, in terms of spend, they, they got a lot of it. Uh, one thing I noticed, by the way, in the fall, so we had the rebound. And the, the categories with the biggest growth in spend, I looked this up like around September-ish, were um, prescription drugs for pain relief, uh, alcohol, <laughs> medical equipment, and bedding, and loans. So I was thinking about that. What picture does that paint of the country in, in September? It was like people with headaches who needed <laughs> a drink and, and we're just very tired. <laughs> Actually sounds exactly right. <laughs> Seems right. Yeah. I think that, that, that describes every single, every parent in America. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And alone, short of money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, it's, that's a, that's a bleak, bleak picture for a, for a bleak year. Yeah. You know, it, but it's funny that you, that you mentioned those things because I think that, um, you know, I, I feel like seeing all of the prescription, you know, drug ads come back uh, when NFL season started, I'm like, ah, that's right. Uh, you know, don't take this when you're doing 5,000 things or whatever. I mean, it, it's like, <laughs> yeah, the warnings. It's one of those things where, yeah. yeah, all the warnings and all that stuff. And I'm like, I didn't see a prescription ad for, I mean, whatever, from, from March, from the Super Bowl until, 
you know, the start of the NFL season. Maybe that's because I don't watch any, uh, any TV. Well, if you watch cable television, you, you would have seen them. Yeah. Like the Hallmark channel or there's a lot of prescription drug ads, but but you're right. I mean, those, that kind of mass product, uh, you know, it needs a mass audience. Yeah, exactly. So I, I'm just curious, like, and this is maybe a broader, a broader question about where this is all going. But, you know, we talk about cord cutters, talk about, you know, obviously, you know, Disney Plus is out there now. Uh, Hulu has a paid offering and then also a paid with no ads offering. You know, everybody using all of these, these services. YouTube TV did a, I, I bought YouTube TV for for the NFL season so that I could watch Red Zone. They were doing like a special promotion thing that I'm going to cancel at the end of the year when I don't need Red Zone anymore. <laughs> but I, I'm just curious, like where, you know, if, if the way to, to reach a lot of people is still through TV, yet so many people are opting out of cable, where does this, how does this all shake up? Yeah, what's reachable and addressable? Well, I think that um, the big winner, like in terms of this year, there's some clear big winners. I think that the things that, that proved resilient that aren't, that aren't going away, one of them is over the top or connected television, which is, um, and streaming in general, streaming services. Now we might say, well, a lot of those are subscription only, there aren't ads. And that's true, you know, for now, um, you can't buy ads on Netflix and they say you never will be able to. But on the other hand, there's just massive influx of people moving to streaming. And there's a lot of apps on streaming and a lot of them you can buy ads on. Uh, Roku sell, you know, you can buy, buy ads on Roku's apps. There's a lot of advertiser supported content. There's going to be more. You know, YouTube has a lot of ads. Hulu has a lot of ads. Um, DirecTV, I guess that's more satellite. But that whole channel, what we might call advanced television or connected television over the top, over the internet, IP delivered television, is growing. It's, it's still small. It's only $4 billion, something like that. And TV, linear TV is around 70, but it's, it's going to grow fast and it's, you know, it's, it's going to grow exponentially. The other big winner is social. I mean, social is obviously people just are on there more. And the big winners are, is Instagram. I think the nonverbal parts of social, the video parts. And then influencers, by the way, we haven't mentioned them, but influencers, um, there was an anti-influencer backlash because they were, there seem to be shallow individuals, some of them <laughs> who are doing the wrong thing. But on the other hand, they're still important and, and they're a great way to kind of reach a niche audience, particularly, you know, um, a highly desirable niche. So I think influencers prove their resilience. And then the other thing is around this kind of user generated feel. There's a, there's a less professional kind of look to a lot of advertising now. And that just comes from the time people spend trolling those videos and they're used to that look and feel now. So it would be unthinkable that, you know, home video type footage would be, you know, on primetime television in the past. But now it's almost like what we expect, that look. And I, I don't think that's going to go away. I think that's kind of here to stay. Yeah, obviously, um, you know, the social piece, TikTok getting enormous and people experimenting with that. Yeah. Snapchat still being there. Um, the different types of, of delivery, you know, channels. Really short videos. I mean, they, they, totally. they're so short now. I'm like, what? <laughs> what was that? Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like someone screaming, like you know, buy pizza, uh, you know, and you're just like, yeah, you get a six second ad. I mean, you, you can't really engage. There's there's a story I read recently in the drum or something. It was a creative director saying it's very hard to engage someone emotionally in six seconds. You could try, but it's like, <laughs> well, then that's what that, but that speaks to the the utility, right? Yeah. And that's and that's what I was going to get to is like now you know the a wise man once said the medium is the message, right? Mm. But I think, you know, it's so funny now is as a marketer, you're now, you know, have this like endless creative, you know, A-B testing funnel. We talked to a, a VP of growth about six months ago or so about how his marketing team, all they do is create content, create copy, like hundreds and hundreds of iterations. And then they just shove it into their... uh AI platform, um, and then it split tests everything for them, right? <laughs> and he's like, that's all our team does. And he's like, I, you could have never, you know, thought that this was the way it is. But now you have to say, like, you know, if you're, if you're Pizza Hut, you need a six second ad and you need, you know, all these other things. So what does it say about the like emotionally res resonant, funny, you know, thoughtful, timely 
you know, 30 second spot at the Super Bowl, it's like a totally different muscle almost to develop that. It's, uh, it, it depends, yeah, it depends on consumers and, you know, they're reluctant to consume ads and in certain formats we're used to leaning forward and we're sort of in a hurry. And so we're, we only have patience for six seconds and it has to be funny or we're going to skip it. But I think, you know, people have proven because of, uh, you know, long form binging and that whole phenomenon that we do have attention spans and we are willing to engage with content for long periods of time, even branded content, I would say, but um, it has to be the right, the right context. And it also has to be sort of the, they have to have our permission and it has to be above board. So I, I don't think long ads are going to go away, but uh, they'll, they'll change form. I was sort of a student of ad history and I, I was researching recently the beginning of radio and um, actually the very first station in, in New York that was taking ads thought it would be like infomercials. They, they thought advertisers would buy half hour blocks. So all the content would come from advertisers. So it's sort of like some cable television you know, channels now it's all, all uh, infomercial. And then, you know, that didn't work out because consumers didn't like it. And so what they ended up doing is that brands would kind of sp loosely sponsor shows and they'd be in and out of them woven in almost like product placement, we'd say. So I think that's probably where we're going to end up. Uh, the way influencers kind of, you know, endorse, but don't endorse different products, they work them into their life. And so I think advertisers are going to become more parts of other you know, other content experiences in the future. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the Steven Spielberg model, right? <laughs> it's like, I'm going to go to all these different advertisers and get get money so that I can make the movie that I want to make. Yeah. And then, you know, E.T.'s going to drink a Coors Yellow Belly uh, in the middle of the movie. And it works because you're engaged with E.T., but then you like the product. It's like a halo. No, I totally agree. I mean, I, I it feels to me that the permissionless, interruptive, you know, ads are... They're not going to go away, but they're just not going to be the best things out there. I think, you know, brands creating and, and uh, facilitating, you know, great content that people love is the future. I talk about it all the time on, on this show that, you know, if you bake it in, if you, if it's the presenting, uh, you know, partner, if it's always around, if, you know, if, uh, was the, that Hulu show, Hulu does this too, Hulu, Hulu does this really well. Or like every episode, somebody gets an Uber or a Lyft. Uh, it's, I think it's a Lyft of like the Runaways, Marvel's Runaways, <laughs> right? It's like yeah. every, I mean, I don't know how they dealt with that during COVID, but that sort of stuff. It's like, if that's your favorite show and it's brought to you by Lyft, you have more affinity to Lyft than if they're just buying 30 second spots. Yeah, the brand, well, with the, from a Salesforce point of view, we think of the ad as part of the journey, customer journey. Yeah. And so, you know, you, it, would, it would be like either you're a customer or a prospect, so you're going through a journey and you, you might get an email, you might have given the email, get a newsletter, whatever, get an offer, might go into a store, then the ad should, you know, know that it should kind of be able to, to fit into your journey wherever you are. So maybe you're in a, in a point where you're really um, looking for a discount, then the ad should know that, or you really need to be kind of, you know, brought into the glamour of the brand. And so being able to do that kind of targeted, but also, you know, contextually empathetic advertising is important and it's not disconnected or disjointed in any way. And so connecting that, you know, it requires a lot of technical muscle on the back end, but when it, when it's executed, I think consumers are more receptive because it's, it's more respectful and it's, it's with a brand that they already have some kind of awareness of and some kind of relationship with. So I think that's the most effective type of ads. So what do you think, um, you wrote about Nielsen, you know, pivoting measurement. So what's going to happen with measurement? Well, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult time. It's, um, I, I was, uh, in, you know, about 10 years ago, I was hyper on multi-touch attribution. So the, the vision then was that we would have user level data. So we'd literally have a picture of every ad a person saw, like an individual, an anonymized person, like we didn't know their name, but, um. And we get those ad logs from Google or wherever, whoever our ad server was, and then build very sophisticated models. And we know exactly what impact every ad had on the outcome, the sale. And that is very appealing intellectually, because then you're like, well, if I know exactly the impact, I can optimize my campaign and I can do better advertising and everyone wins. 
But what happened is that, you know, the, the walls went up, and so user-level data is extremely hard to come by, and in future, it will be, I would say, impossible to come by, unless they're literally your customers. <laughs> so the future measurement is going to be some form of aggregate measurement, and it will look a lot like the past of mixed modeling, but I just think the techniques, the modeling techniques will be better, uh, and it will be at various levels. You know, you, you can only use the data you have. So in future, as many advertisers will spend quite a lot with not only the big walled gardens, Facebook, Instagram, so on, but also the mini walled gardens that show up, big publishers who will have their own little gardens. And somehow you have to optimize over these, these walls, essentially, but you don't, you don't know if any individual has gone to two different walls and then done something. So it's, it's hard to do, but it can be done through a combination of these econometric models plus a lot of testing. And the kind of the whole art of A-B testing, you mentioned that earlier, and the best marketers have always been doing this. And um, that whole art, it's going to come back into fashion. It went out of fashion for a while. People were looking for, you know, the silver bullet software solution, SBSS, the silver bullet software solution, which uh, never exists. So, uh, yeah, I think it, the future is complex, but it's in, in that way, it'll actually be better. It'll be less of an illusion and, and more reality. Can you tell me the House of Lies story? Um, because I, this is, it's, um, first of all, the, the, the name house of lies, how management consultants steal your watch and then tell you the time is an all time great title. So kudos to you, you. for writing that. Cause that's, that's exceptional. Um, but yeah, how did this, how did this all come about? Well, I was a, uh, after business school, I became a management consultant and I worked at a consulting firm in New York. And I wanted to be in media, but then the media business dried up 2001, 2002. So got into a different type of consulting, but I, I was disgruntled, as you'd say. And so I, I just felt like consultants used a lot of words that didn't have any meaning. And they, they're kind of like fluffy. And uh, so I started to create a dictionary. I was going to be the consultant to English dictionary and it would be you know helpful. And um, it, that turned into a memoir. So I just started writing about my experience as a, you know, an entry level associate at this firm. And that, it really wrote itself. I mean, it just poured out of me uh, <laughs> disgruntledness. And I did, I mean, I, I obscured the name of the clients and everything, but I, I had a lot of real stuff in there, including our billing rates. And so the consultants, it, it was published. Consultants hated it. I mean, they hated it. They, if you go on Amazon, you see all these one star review. This is the worst book I've ever read. And, then a bunch of people gave it five stars and they're like, this is, a, you know, it's the best book I've ever read. So I have a, I think I have an average of a three, <laughs> all fives and one, which told me I was doing something right. And then it was, <laughs> I think Tolstoy does too, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, at least I said something, got kind of some reaction, um, but then uh, it was turned into a show on Showtime. That was a producer who just kind of ran with it. So I was involved a little bit in the show, but um, not as much as I wanted to be. So how, I mean, does someone come knocking? Like, did you, did you pitch this? Like, you know, after you wrote the book, like how'd that come about? Uh, it's a bit of a fluke, which, um, cause it's a business book. So I didn't, I didn't think of it as a television show, but it was uh, an excerpt of it ran in a magazine called the week. And a woman who had not produced anything before, but was married to a, a famous screenwriter uh, decided that she, she wanted to try to pitch this in Hollywood and she had connection. I had none. So she's like, would you let me try to pitch it? And I'm like, go for it. You know, God bless you. And she got it made. It took a long time and there were a lot of hurdles. The, the, show, the show came out in 2012 and um, the book was published in 2005. So you can see the, the delay there. And that was all kind of development and trying to get an actor. Don Cheadle ended up playing Marty Kahn. My name is Marty Kine. And uh, we're very different, me and him. <laughs> That's all I'll say. But my, my role on the show was interesting. I was a consultant on the show, which I think is fun, pretty fun. I was the consultant about consulting. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, a really cool, uh, it's a really cool thing. And I think it speaks to just like kind of how cool it is to be a marketer, right? I think a lot of people, you know, who you know, we've seen over and over again on the show, didn't necessarily always major in marketing and yeah. in school that they had a circuitous route to get to be a, uh, a senior marketing leader. But all of those little things kind of matter in the end. You know, not everybody has their book optioned, but uh, 
uh, truly a, a one of a kind background uh, from Marty Khan. I always say, you know, about marketing is, and I agree with you, by the way, I say, because my dad was a, he was a trauma doctor. So he would go down in the helicopter to car wrecks and he'd come home and I'd be like, how was work, dad? And, and he's like, well, we only lost two people today and one person lived and that was his day. And so I vowed then never to have a job that was life or death. I, I did not want to deal with that level of stress in my life. So I, you know, was always attracted to marketing because nobody dies. You know, the worst thing that happens is someone sees a, an inappropriate or ad or that's, you know, irrelevant. So what? It'll happen. You know, it's happened. So it's, it really is about fun. And um, I always tell people, you know, people, when they ask me, don't forget about the show business element of marketing. It, it is part, it always will be part, you know, P.T. Barnum and part show and part Hollywood. And um, that's the fun part. So I totally agree. And I think that that's why we get so upset with all the lame, you know, marketing campaigns out there and the tone deaf <laughs> stuff that we saw earlier this year and all that stuff. It's oh. like life is too short to be like that lame. Right. And it's like, you know, I understand that not everybody is, is blessed with, um, you know, the creative chops to be able to make something great. But, you know, we had, um, we had one of the writers of a band of brothers on the show, uh, you know, earlier in the year. And we were talking about like, there's a lot of writers right now that are, you know, sitting there waiting for somebody to call them up. And, and it's like, if you're looking for a creative person, I, you know, you can find that person who has screenwriting credits on some of your favorite shows. And I guarantee you, they'd love a, they love to punch up some of the stuff that you're doing or write some stuff for you. So I think that people get scared by that. And, you know, if you're just kind of going to the same old well with the same old group of people, you know, you're not really going to make something creative. And I think the other thing is like, make some fiction, write something, <laughs> like bring something new into the world, you know? Yeah. And it's like, you know, there was nobody, nobody who was trying to figure out how to sell beer was thinking about, about the most interesting man in the world. They like created that from scratch, right? And like that was an extremely resonant campaign. So I just, I think that there's a lot of more, more of that to be done. And final piece, I also, I was a lifeguard and then I was in the army for a decade. And I also vowed that my next job was not going to be life or death. So I literally <laughs> said the same thing. Yeah. When you, when you get a first or second hand to that kind of thing, you're like, no, thanks. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we always say marketing is meant to be remarkable and, uh, and that's the goal. And that means somebody has to talk about it to somebody else. And if, if, you're, uh, if, you're, if they're not doing that, then, uh, or unless they're just going to buy it themselves, then, then you're probably uh, off base. Yep. Any other final, uh, you know, thoughts on what does 2021 hold? Any, uh, any uh, crystal ball predictions here? I'm bullish on advertising. I know at, uh, at Salesforce, we have a DMP, we have uh, social advertising products and the whole kind of future of the cookie is really consuming people now. And, but I think that'll, that'll all kind of sort itself out. And in general, if we you know, keep our eye on the, on the bigger picture, which is that advertising has a lot of very creative, smart people in it. And it is a great way to you know, grease the wheels of commerce and so on, uh, help your company do well. So I think that advertising will, will thrive. And uh, we're just at a point of transition right now. So I don't think, I don't believe that the advertising is, is dead in any way. Awesome. Marty, thanks so much for joining. Um, any, uh, any final thoughts or any other things that we need to, before 2020 thankfully comes to a close that uh, <laughs> you can impart on the audience? Yeah. Well, 2020 proved to me personally that uh, I am more resilient and adaptable than I thought. You know, I can, I can roll with it in a way that I didn't think I could. And uh, I think a lot of my friends and family have seen that too and my company and, and the people I know. So I think that we just bear that in mind. You know, I think it's a great uh, testament to, to a lot of us that um, we are a lot more adaptable and tougher than we think. So that's encouraging, don't you think? Totally, super encouraging. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I spent a year uh, of my life uh, living in, was fortunate to be living in uh, a bunch of wooden walls uh, in the middle of, uh, of nowhere. And, uh, you know, with porta potties, and I was the lucky one because I had a porta potty. So, yeah. uh, being shelter in place and being able to walk outside when there's not fires, and being able to uh, support our our brothers and sisters and and things like that. I mean, to me, you know, I'm a bit of an optimist, but uh, I'm I'm super bullish on 2021, and uh, you know, life gets better if we if we work hard at it. So, yeah. Thanks, Marty. We appreciate it. Uh, we got to have you back again. This is, has to be a recurring thing now because this is great. Oh, anytime. Yeah. Every quarter we can update. See what's going on. Yeah, there we go. Thanks, Ian. Take care. 
Marketing Trends Podcast is brought to you by Salesforce. Discover marketing built on the world's number one CRM, Salesforce. Put your customer at the center of every interaction. Automate engagement with each customer and build your marketing strategy around the entire customer journey. Salesforce, we bring marketing and engagement together. Learn more at salesforce.com slash marketing.